to embrace a same-sex identity then is implicitly to contradict that design. That is a profoundly disrespectful view yeah. of the body. Being homosexual is disrespecting your body. Happy Pride! Hello lovely people, my name is Emma. Today we are going to be listening to the latest episode of the Girl Defined podcast. This is a channel that I actually have watched lots of other people talk about, somehow missed entirely that they have a podcast. Someone on Instagram very kindly told me about their latest episode told slash warned me because by all accounts it's not going to be a super fun one. So very quick rundown for anybody out there who is not familiar with Girl Defined. They follow the trend of most of the other evangelical female Christian internet personalities, much like the transformed wife who we just talked about recently. They preach to women that their focus should be on becoming wives and homemakers and mothers and good Christian women and nothing outside of that, whilst running their own ministry, publishing books, running an online business. Again, it's very much do as I say, not as I do. Again, like The Transformed Wife, they, in my opinion, have extremely dangerous, very damaging views that they spread to quite a large audience, particularly focused on young women. It's so harmful and it's all dressed up under the guise of love. It's very much, you should love everyone and be good to everyone, but it's probably safer if you're not friends with a homosexual. It's that kind of, uh, it's that kind of love. Bearing in mind that this is something that they have been deeply indoctrinated into, regardless, I believe that what they share is extremely harmful. So we're just going to focus on this particular podcast episode. Their podcasts are an hour long, so this is going to be at least a two-parter. I'll skip anything that isn't interesting or relevant. I'll try and split up the chapters in a helpful way. A lot of that is down to how they split up their podcast. I have never listened to it before, so I don't know how they do it, but hopefully they do it in a way that makes it easy for us. So I'll be real. The title made me cross. Right from the start, the title made me cross. So I've got a green tea. I'm having a delicious green tea with raspberry. And I'm just going to try and be as relaxed and rational as possible while we listen to what is undoubtedly going to be, and this is your content warning, which I'll put in the description everything as well. It's almost certainly going to be homophobic, it's going to be bigoted in general, it's going to be transphobic, they're going to talk about being anti-abortion, aka anti-healthcare. It's going to be a ride, so brace yourselves, skip parts that you don't think you can deal with. If the whole video sounds like it would stress you out, please skip it. You have no obligation to listen to any of this. I'm listening to it so that you don't have to, you know? And I will try and make this as least a stressful experience as I can. So I'm going to start by giving you the title and the description so that you can be in the place that I'm at right now. This is episode 33, if you're interested. What homosexuality, transgenderism, always get nervous when a Christian says the word transgenderism. What homosexuality, transgenderism and abortion have in common with Professor Nancy Piercy? I'll put a link in the description to who she is. Nancy Piercy is a professor of apologetics. She teaches Christian worldview and apologetics, history of Christian thought, history of Christianity and science, so I'm interested to see how that plays into her discussion of abortion. She's well written. Obviously her books are all around discussions of Christianity, but she's well written. The two women who run the Girl Defined show, by the way, are Kristen and Bethany. So those are the three that should be involved in this. Let's take a look at the description. In many ways, it feels like having an open and honest discussion about homosexuality, transgenderism, and or abortion is off limits. Does it? Because I feel like we discuss that all the time. I've discussed that twice on my channel already. I'm pretty sure Girl Defined have discussed it on their channel. I'm pretty sure a lot of people are discussing all of these things constantly. I think because their opinion is bigoted, they probably get a lot of backlash and that's what makes it difficult in their eyes. If the thoughts don't line up with the cultural norm, the cultural norm being you know, human rights for all, despite gender, sexuality, etc. Curse those cultural norms. If the thoughts don't line up with the cultural norm, you better keep them to yourself. Despite the pressure to stay silent on these issues, we are not staying silent. There is too much at stake. So I always think it's so funny, not funny in a ha-ha way, funny in a how peculiar kind of way, that these type of evangelical accounts are always talking about how hard it is to talk about their views, how hard it is to be 
a bigot. It's so hard. It's so hard, they say, discussing this on their podcast, which is freely available to anyone on the massive platform Spotify. They have an enormous YouTube channel. How is it difficult in any way for them to discuss their viewpoints? The only way that they think it's difficult is because the majority of people disagree with them, because where the bulk of our society is in modern times is a thousand years in advance of their morality. And therefore, people like me find their content to be hateful and call them out on it. And that can be the only reason that it's so difficult, because it's not difficult. God's word isn't silent on these topics and neither should we be. Again, I have an opinion that will never line up with any biblical Christian because I don't believe in God. I would just like to keep throwing out there that this word of God, this God's word that they are relying on for teaching all people absolute morality, it's essentially a collection of stories, a thousand years old, cobbled together by tons of different writers, and that is what they are choosing to use as a basis to inflict their views upon the world. And I'll also just say, and I have to thank everyone from the comments of the Transformed Wife video for pointing this out and kind of making me think about this. It is just so coincidental that the life that these women lead and enjoy leading just happens to be exactly what God wants for all women. That is so lucky for them. And aren't we blessed that they're sharing the message with everyone else? What divine power do they think they have to understand the Bible in a way that millions of others don't? I'll, n I'll never understand it. In today's conversation, Professor Nancy Piercy brings her wisdom and expertise to the conversation. She unpacks what homosexuality, transgenderism, hookup culture, that wasn't in the title, but that's apparently in here as well, hookup culture and abortion all have in common. Is it that they're all what the devil wants? Because that's what the transformed wife said. She shows us why our designer's intentional plan for our body matters. Because, she, because Professor Pierce knows. <laughs> I just can't help but wonder, when you talk about God's a plan for our bodies, how evolution and natural selection factors into that. Does he know the entire future and past and he has planned out natural selection? Or are the three people involved in this podcast young earth creationists? I don't know the answers to these questions. I don't know if they're going to ask them. I have a feeling that in their discussion of why homosexuality is bad, they might not bring up what about evolution. But it's a question that I feel is deeply relevant in discussing the relevance of certain parts of the human body. Because let's not forget, our, our designer who made us perfectly in his image left in a lot of weird hang-ups from, you know, our evolutionary history. Body parts that we don't need anymore. A lot of evidence of that in other animals as well. I don't know, I just wonder where Kristen and Bethany and Professor Pierce- Professor Piercy, I keep saying her name wrong, I do apologise. I wonder where these three factor those things into their beliefs. All I have at the moment is questions. So, I'm gonna put my headphones on, I'm gonna have a big gulp of green tea, and we're gonna get started. I probably should have said earlier, by the way, if I look super tired, I'm really sorry. I had my first vaccine a couple of days ago, and I have been completely fine, apart from being super tired no side effects. My arm doesn't even hurt anymore. It's brilliant. It was only two days ago. But if I look, if I have massive rings under my eyes and look exhausted, it's, it's probably the vaccine. So let's listen to these two young, wealthy, white women talk about how hard it is to openly be a bigot. I am kind of freaking out because I am so excited that I had the opportunity to interview Professor Piercy. Um, you're going to learn a lot about her as we get into this, but Professor Nancy Piercy is someone who I admire and respect so much. I have heard many of her interviews. I've read her book, Love Thy Body, and has done all the work to unpack these huge issues of homosexuality. It's probably safe to assume that this woman is straight, and I love that she has done all of the work to understand homosexuality. <laughs> sure, okay, yeah, why not? Transgenderism, abortion, hookup culture, things that are uh, like in our culture, in our faces right now, whether it's something you're dealing with or someone you know that. I, uh, I, I just have to step in again and say that the idea that things like different sexualities and being transgender are like new to modern culture is so far from correct. I'll throw some, I'll, I'll do some proper digging and I'll throw some good sources into the description. Transgender people have existed throughout 
human history. I just showed off my Thomas the Bisexual Goose shirt because that is one of so many examples of queer representation in nature. Like the idea that these things are exclusive to humans and exclusive to modern humans and simply a part of our modern culture is so incorrect. I'm sorry, we're not even a minute in. I'm going to I'm going to let her talk more now. Dealing with one of those things or just curiosity of how to approach and talk about these things um, in a biblical way, she is going to give us just incredible help and hope um, with these topics. So you're, you know, you're going to want to share this with your friends for sure. This is, you know, a conversation that many of us can feel scared to have, intimidated to have, almost like this is off limits to have in many ways, but it's not. And the Bible has answers and God's design for our lives brings so much clarity. Before we jump into that conversation, though, I just want to make sure that you are coming or planning to come to the 2021 Girl Defined Conference. So if you are coming... I would love nothing more. If I was in the U.S., and it was COVID safe and I had the money and the time. I would love nothing more than to attend the Girl Defined Conference next time next time. Who has designed us? Who has created us? Who has made us as women, as females? That is uniquely different from men. We need to... Again, I would say it's not a it's not a who, but a what processes. How we can live that out to honor and glorify God um, with our unique design and with our unique lives, really. This is going to be redundant, but I'll just put this out there once just to put my position on the line. We weren't designed. I've said the word evolution like three times already. We weren't designed. Evolution is fact. It's science. It's history. We were not designed. We evolved over a very long period of time. I guess if that's the core of their argument, I'm going to find it hard to engage in this discussion, but I'll do my best. Um, and so if you want to learn more about your identity in Christ, if you want to learn how to be bold and courageous and to shine bright, not for your own glory, but to point others to Christ through his strength within you, then I encourage you to go to girldefined.com slash conference, girldefined.com slash conference to grab your tickets today. Thank you, Nancy, so much for being here. I am honored and I know our sisterhood over at Girl Defined is honored as well just to get to hear your wisdom. But for those who haven't heard of you or don't know you, can you just give us a quick introduction? Yeah, so I'm a professor of cultural apologetics at Houston Baptist University. And and that means I get to teach young people arguments for God's existence all day long. Which wow. I, <laughs> can you think of a better job? Um, astronaut, an animator, at Aardman Studios, people who make car adverts for the cinema. All I ever talk about is, you know, why the Christian worldview is true, uh, how it is, um, you know, superior to any non-Christian worldview, and how it gives us wow. a better roadmap. Everyone like this of every religion, right? And if she was born somewhere else and had been born into a completely different religion, she would be just as convinced that I don't know, Islam was the true belief. They're always so sure that they have found the narrow path. It's not true because it gives you a better roadmap. It gives you a better roadmap because it's true. Mm. Because if something is really true, it will in fact work out better in mm. real life. It will fit reality. Uh, that's what- Like science. I'm just saying if you're looking for objective truth, I just think that maybe, you know, the scientific method and experimentation might be slightly more beneficial than Christian apologetics. What we mm. want to convey is that Christianity actually fits reality. Um, and <laughs> I have read the Bible and I politely disagree. It's literally factually incorrect from page one. But people aren't asking anymore. Is Christianity true? They're asking, why are Christians such bigots? Mm. The conversation has shifted. And so I felt like I had to write a book on what you might call moral apologetics. In other words, how do we share Christianity is true in, re in regard to these cutting edge moral issues like abortion, euthanasia, homosexuality, transgenderism? Again, referring to them as cutting edge issues, it's incorrect. It's it's disingenuous. I think it's insulting to the entire LGBTQ plus community to refer to our sexualities and gender as issues. My my sexuality isn't an issue, thank you very much. It's actually Christianity that has a higher view of the body and sexuality than the secular view does. Except that it expects you to live without love or intimacy 
if you were born with a certain sexuality, except for that. Everyone's thinking like, okay, well, prove it. What does that mean? And we're going to get into that. That's the entire purpose of this episode. But get really quickly, it. can you clarify? Because you named several different, you, you know, homosexuality, abortion, transgenderism, hookup culture. There are so many different things that you mentioned in your book and that you just mentioned personally. And it's it kind of seems like, okay, this is such a wide, such a different, diverse set of issues, but somehow they come together in your book. Can you explain how that is? Yes, I know. That was one of the most interesting and surprising aspects of my book, Love Thy Body. You know, I'd like to jump in with a, uh, an example because it's easier to see with something yeah. very concrete. Um, and let's take the cutting edge issue of our day, which is transgenderism. Mm -hmm. It is the transgender movement. Again, I'm going to throw some sources in the description, but just to, for the sake of putting this in the video as well, Around 5,000 to 3,000 BC, there were Gala, described as androgynous or trans priests of the Sumerian goddess Inanna. Sometime from 200 to 300 BC, in ancient Greece, there were Gali priests who again wore feminine attire, identified as women, and therefore have been identified by scholars as early transgender figures. In South Asia, at least eight known gender expansive identities have historically been present in the subcontinent. Around the 18th century, the Ittlemans of Siberia recognised a third gender called, and I'm going to butcher this, Kurkuch. I'm sure that was completely wrong, I'm so sorry. They recognised this third gender to describe individuals who were assigned male at birth but expressed themselves as women. It is not some modern issue of the day. It is not something new that the liberals are just have pulled out of nowhere. It's just the continuation of historical fact. The fact that more people are discussing something doesn't mean it's a new issue. And I think that a professor of apologetics should acknowledge that. The transgender movement represents body hatred. Mm. If you value the body or not. Yeah. So when you wrote this, just out of curiosity, when you wrote Love Thy Body, were you anticipating where the culture was going or was this just a passion of yours and you didn't even realize how extreme things would become? Oh, that's a very good question um, because people people often put it... Things have become so extreme. If this was going to be a decent, rational discussion, I would need Bethany to define what she means by extreme. Let's back up to homo homosexuality, yeah. which was the, the previous you know, big... Um, Let's back up to homosexuality. I'm sorry. I hate myself. <laughs> homosexuality likewise represents a denigration of the body. Because essentially what they're saying is, well, if you if I talk to my uh, homo... I'm not a professor, all right? I'm not as well-spoken or well-read as this woman on the topic she teaches. But I have studied a lot and I've listened to a lot of professors and I've listened to a lot of amazing and a few terrible professors, right? She just comes across as such an amateur when she says things like, they say, who is they? Is they gay people? None of them really denies that on the level of biology, physiology, um, anatomy, chromosomes and so on, in other words, on the level of biology, males and females are counterparts, mm. counterparts to one another. That that okay, Professor, uh, gosh, I wish I was involved in this discussion and I could actually interject and ask her, ask her questions. Where do intersex people fall into this very rigid male and female groups that you have? Through our evolution, men and women have generally evolved distinct. But there are still people who biologically, according to her all-powerful biological terms, there are people of varying chromosomes and different amounts of different hormones that you typically find in men and typically find in women, different characteristics that you typically find in men or typically find in women. She's not a professor of biology. She's she's no remote qualifications in that area. So for her to make this assertion that this is a biological fact, I feel like I bring up intersex people a lot. It's just that they are so frequently left out of the discussion because in these people's minds, I guess it's much easier Oh, somebody's banging outside, that's really helpful. I guess it's much easier to just imagine that the people that don't fit into their two categories don't exist. How the human sexual and reproductive system is designed. To embrace a same-sex identity then is implicitly to... Con a same-sex identity? To embrace a same-sex identity. Biology, males and females are counterparts, mm. counterparts to one another. That that's how the human sexual and we 
I'm getting I'm getting flashbacks to being in like year six, like ten years old, and my male teacher like really awkwardly telling us the the penis and the vagina fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. I, I don't want to be rude to this woman because, like I say, in terms of Christian apologetics, her knowledge and experience far outstrips mine. I'm still absolutely going to call her out on her awful bad faith arguments. To embrace a same-sex identity then is implicitly to contradict that design. It's to say, why should my body inform my identity? Or why should my biological sex as male or female have any say in my moral choices? Because your, your sexuality isn't anything to do with your moral choices. I don't necessarily want to be that guy, but to throw out a single word question for Professor Piercy on, you know, the human body and sexuality. Prostate? Help people to see is that that, that is a profoundly disrespectful view yeah. of the body. It's disrespectful to not be straight, guys. If you're not straight, you're disrespecting your body. This is what they call a, a loving opinion, a loving godly belief to spread to your gay friends. If your friends are homosexual, just tell them they're disrespecting their bodies. Again, what we should say to people is why accept such a demeaning view mm. of the body? And by pitting demeaning. the mind against the body, it, again, it leads to sort of internal self-alienation. And, and Let's say for argument's sake, I'm single. I'm seeing a lady. What exactly is going against my body? What am I disrespecting about my body? There's nothing here that explains her perspective. She's just saying things and Bethany is like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we're just assuming the random things she's just saying into the ether. We're assuming those are true and moving our argument forward from there. This is such a disingenuous way to have a discussion. Mm. And so what what I do in Love Thy Body, by the way, it's not just arguments like this. I have lots of lots of um, stories. Lots of oh yeah, stories. and so oh I'll, yeah, I'll give you just one uh, on homosexuality. Sorry. There's a, a young woman who lived as a lesbian for many years, and today is married. Oh good, oh good, a conversion story. I love these. Married to a man, you have to say that. Yes, <laughs> married to a man and has three, two children, two children. Um, but she wrote an article in which she said, uh, like, so what was the turning point for her? She said, I came to trust that God had made me female for a reason. And I decided to honor my... God didn't make her female. She is only the person she is through chance being the offspring of her parents. Like, I know that these people believe that God made every person, but if you have a rational scientific view of how people evolved and are born, it's so irrelevant to the conversation. So the other thing, because they're explicitly saying in the title, in everything Professor Piercy has said, in everything Bethany has said, when they talk about sexuality, they've exclusively said homosexuality. This is just a postulate that I'm throwing out there. I wonder if there aren't all these success stories of Christian men and women who have converted from being gay to being straight. I wonder if a portion of that isn't just bisexual erasure in Christianity. How many of these people have suffered because they've been attracted to somebody of the same gender and then found that they've miraculously come out the other side and are attracted to somebody of another gender and they've been like, oh wow, God must have cured me. How many of those people might just have been bisexual and never taught that that was a possibility? Just something that I wonder. I'm just saying it's Pride Month and we exist. Being homosexual is disrespecting your body. Happy Pride. By living in accord with the creator's design. We weren't designed. And after that is when she began to, <laughs> here's how she put it. To my great surprise, I felt a flicker of heterosexual desire. <laughs> wow. Uh, so that was a that was a turnaround. But what look at what turned her around. It was not shame or guilt. It was I wanted to honor my body mm. and live in accord with the creator's design. Mm -hmm. And so that's what Love Thy Body, my book, is about. It's about how to Sounds like this might be a woman who was hyper focused on her struggle with same sex attraction and could have discovered that she was bisexual. That really sounds like a possibility that wouldn't change any of the story. In the church, and, and the, the stereotypes about Christians are that we use negative language. It's a sin, it's wrong, it's against yeah. the Bible, and something's wrong with you. 
that, mm-hmm. That's the bottom line in terms of the message people pick up. And so Love Thy Body is all about changing that language and saying... I'm sorry, it's still negative. You can, this is the thing, right? Her whole thing is that, yes, you can dress it up in frilly positive language. Again, it's exactly like the Girl Defined Channel and the Transformed Wife. You can dress it up in frilly goodness and pretty pink colours and say it's about love. But when your message is still that being gay is wrong and you're disrespecting your body for making that choice, that's still a negative message, right? That is still a destructive, harmful, bullshit message. I don't care how nicely you dress it up, I don't care what kind of positive language you think you're using, it is still a negative, harmful message. And you shouldn't be spreading it in 2021. The, the whole point of this is honouring your body, living in harmony mm. with your body. My body, I'm just gonna say this. I'm I'm ge- I'm generally fine with my body. It's been over a year of working from home and not really going out and there's more flab than I'm used to. But you know, my body's fine. But it's essentially just a meat sack that I use to carry myself around, right? Sometimes I look in the mirror and I'm like, "Oh yeah, that's what I look like." Because the actual reflection of my outside appearance is different to the sort of amorphous blob of consciousness that I sort of picture myself as, you know? But does that mean to Professor Piercy that I am not respecting my body? I mean, it's mine, you know? I can do what I want with it. It's not a person itself that demands respect. Even if I was a Christian, I have to assume that I would still believe in evolution. I still don't think I would consider it disrespecting God to want to change my body, because he didn't make it. My mum and dad made it. And they didn't really have any choice in what I was going to come out like. Respecting who God made you to be. I've always had this little bit of extra flesh on my ear. Why'd God put that there? God? What was that for? Why did you give me a new mole on this arm? It sounds preposterous, doesn't it? I am going to have to stop here for today because this has already gone on so long. Just for the record, we're about 18 minutes in. So this is going to totally end up being like a three-parter. We've just about dipped into homosexuality and that's as far as we've gotten. And it's already quite frustrating. Well, it's already extremely frustrating if I'm being honest. I don't know why I'm holding back so much. I hope you found this interesting. Do let me know what you think in the comments down below. Am I being unfair to Professor Piercy, do you think? Do you agree with some of my criticisms of the way she constructs her arguments? What do you think about how Bethany is conducting this interview? What do you think about them choosing to do this during Pride Month? Do like this video if you enjoyed it. Let me know if you want to see and are excited to see a part two. I'll be honest, I'm probably going to do it anyway because I'm interested in listening to this. You can follow me on my gaming channel and on Twitch. And of course, before we go, I would like to... And of course, I would like to give an enormous shout out to my giant chickens over on Patreon. Amber, Chick-fil-A Death Fries, Conla, Chicken Maximus Lions, Goddammit Conla, Manny, Miss Bumberiest, Mr. Creosote, Taxman, and Vernon Stubbs. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Have a very lovely week and I will see you really soon. And get vaccinated.